I love psychology. I'm obsessed with the human mind, with the way our emotions are created, since I remember myself. But coming to think of it, our level of understanding emotions today resembles a lot to medicine before the invention of the microscope. It was only the invention of the microscope that helped advance medicine and push mankind to begin exploring the world of tiny elements, that despite the fact they are invisible to our naked eye, they are still very real and very influential in our life, very significant. Looking at the way we analyze emotions today, we need an objective tool to help us explore, set the right definitions, and only then we can properly classify and understand emotions. We need a way to measure what does not meet our senses. We need a microscope. We need an emotional microscope. Today, I will try to open a window for you into the world of tiny human properties, tiny human voice properties, that we found to be very significant in our 17 years of study emotions. In 1997, during a research designed to build a new generation of lie detectors, and together with a team of fellow experts in psychology, signal processing, mathematics and criminology, we started exploring the properties of the human voice. Following the footsteps of the then-current literature, written over the 60s of the previous century, and that wasn't much of a start. Towards that goal, it was pretty clear that we must focus on the uncontrolled and inner properties of the voice, the tiny patterns inside the phonetic voice pattern. Today, 17 years later, we have a set of software mathematical procedures designed to extract and compute many unique and tiny voice indications, collectively known as the LVA technology or layered voice analysis. This is our emotional microscope. Now, voice analysis is, in fact, made of three very distinct disciplines. We have voice print, identifying the person speaking, focusing on the audible, steady, and unique characteristics in the voice. We have speech-to-text, to its top technologies, focuses on what is being said, understanding the textual message being delivered. And then we have emotional analysis. How do we feel? What is the emotional experience we feel as we speak? While all these disciplines have tremendous value in any communication, and especially in modern computer sciences, we were focused only on the third discipline, the one that was the least explored, and many even doubted if possible at all, as it is based on the vocal indications totally ignored up until the LVA development. In every interaction we have with others, almost all of us, consciously or not, are picking up some non-verbal cues from the speaker. We try to evaluate their mental state, their personality traits, their emotional reactions, even their honesty. And indeed, when we communicate with others, we voluntarily sometimes change our tone of voice to reflect a state of mind. I'm so happy to meet you. I'm not too sure about it. I am very firm in my decision. I'm very angry, right? But how often do we let our voice reveal our true emotions? How often do we use our voice to create an emotion, an emotional expression, that masks the absence of a current one, of a, of a real one? How often do we try to control our voice to sound normal so it will not give away our true emotions? So when you think about it, there are two sets of emotions. There are the ones we express externally and the ones we feel inside. They're not necessarily the same. The biggest challenge we faced with our development was, in fact, based on this very fundamental difference between the three categories, between these three disciplines. When we deal with speech-to-text, or speaker verification, it is very obvious to identify, to, to evaluate the accuracy of the detection, because the criterion of analysis is obvious. This is not, as I'm sure you noticed, not the same with emotion detection. Emotions are not necessarily expressed, vocalized, or even admitted to if properly assessed. And laboratory research will most likely not be very useful too. If you ask students to fake emotions, so you can learn how to identify how it sounds, most likely you'll be able to identify, well, fake emotions. A better plan was needed. This will not stand in real life. Now, since our original intention was to build a lie detector, it was obvious that the relevant vocal cues will not be expressed. There is no tone of voice saying, I'm lying. On the contrary, we had to learn to ignore any and all vocal parameters that the speaker can control. If we are looking at the real and sometimes hidden emotions, 
it was obvious that we need to look deeper into the voice, deeper into the voice patterns and find the golden nugget that is indicative of the lie. But the golden nugget was never found. Today, frankly, I doubt if it exists. As our entire knowledge of what is a lie and what emotions and emotional experience accompany a lie is really very far from where we started. For the past 17 years, and hundreds of thousands of recordings analyzed, we could not find the single voice property that would indicate a lie on a consistent or even statistically significant manner. We did, however, during the course of our research, identify the set of 151 tiny voice elements, unique marks, most of which are present in the sub-10 millisecond time frames that appear on the vocal waveform. These marks are captured using both timeline analysis as well as the frequency domain. And we found ways to cluster them and compute several second-order variables that were found one after the other, slowly, slowly, to correlate with key human reactions in response to controlled, verified or obvious stimulus, but under real-life settings. These voice samples were collected in many places around the world, in many different languages, from call centers, investigation rooms, casual discussions with friends, controlled experiments. We had to make sure that these are universal and not influenced by culture or tonal of language. At first, we identified, defined three basic sensations. The primitive, instinctive feelings people experience. We have stress in response to a negative or a threat, negative expectations or a threat. Excitement in response to what is typically positive expectations, positive stimulus, or confusion, or cognitive stress, as sometimes referred to, when the nature of the stimulus is not clear. In a Stroop test, for example, those of you are familiar with it. We were also able to identify mental effort, some form of hesitation, anticipation, embarrassment, concentration, what we call today, for the lack of a better term, emotional energy, which is neither positive or negative by itself, but it is one of the most important indications for arousal, engagement and fatigue. And lastly, after a specific request from a large customer and additional two years of research, we were able to identify anger, happiness and upset, which are incredibly complicated feelings. So let me share with you some interesting findings. Emotions are not always what we even think they are. From a psychological point of view, what is anger? Would you say anger is some form of stress? Our original assumption was that it will be a combination of stress and high concentration. Sounds reasonable? Well, two years of research taught us that anger is in fact the dissolvement of stress. Stress and anger cannot coexist. We also found, we also found that the, the tiny indications indicative of logical concept and logical apprehending also disappear with anger. Stress it pushes us back to protect from harm. Anger pushes us forward, ready for a fight. Sounds familiar now? Another interesting puzzle. Can you be concentrated and embarrassed at the same time? Strange enough, not relating emotions, but no, you cannot. What is happy? What is sad? How much sadness is sad? What is an argument? If I will call my cellular company and yelling at them, I'm going to sue them. Am I angry or, in fact, happy? So now that we understand better the psychological side complexity, let's look at the other side, the mathematical one. As signal processing experts, surely you notice there are many challenges when you deal with the world of tiny audio markers. Noise will harm them, compression may kill them, low amplitude will distort them. In fact, we have to count on the manufacturer of the lowest price phone, buying the cheapest microphone you could find, passing its signal through a set of unknown compressions and wires, until it reaches us in an analysis box. Almost impossible mission, right? Yet we found that most of these factors are steady throughout the session and therefore can be considered a stable unknown, and we found ways to mathematically deal with them. 
As a method of dealing with the effectors, for example, we decided to take a similar approach to the one used in medicine. We run statistical polls. We take a voice fragment and we ask, what type of emotional indications do you contain? And from that, we conclude, for the, using statistical tools, we will then conclude for the entire voice segment. The unknown levels of norm, and today we get very good results, even in harsh conditions. But it should be clear, emotion detection through voice analysis is not a Boolean science. It can't be. This is a science based on statistics, and the better the quality and size of sample group, the better prediction will be. Now I want to show you some practical use of LVA today, starting with the security world. Today you can see LVA serves intelligence uh, organization, police forces around the world. Here you can see it helping solve um, the horrific gang rape murder case in India of the reporter last year, using another system for uh, vetting employees into sensitive positions. Fighting insurance fraud. Can you believe that ratios of fraud we find today all over the world exceeds 30% of all claims? We just don't realize how much we all, each and every one of us, pay in his premium every year for insurance fraud committed by others. We are actually paying for the losses of the financial organizations. We help to put an end to that. These are particularly two interesting utilization of practical use of emotion detection. One is from a commercial call center, and one is from um, a security phone interception system. Think for a moment about that. Companies spend millions of dollars hiring advertisement companies, the best actors, screenwriters. You build a brand. And then a potential client, such as yourself maybe, makes the call. You want to buy. You want to become a new client. But the call center agent may be having a bad day. Today, he doesn't want to speak with you, doesn't feel like speaking with you. He couldn't care less. The chances his chat with you will be monitored by his management team is less than 1%. Due to his attitude, you decide to go away. You decide not to become a client. And if you can, you will stand on a stage and tell the world about your experience. I just did. Using our emotional SDK, we assist call center managers all over the world to evaluate the phone agent's performance in each and every call. Get real-time alerts when their customers are getting angry or upset or the call goes off track. It's not about the choice of words. It's not about the tone of voice. It is about the hardcore emotion. The decision to buy and become a new client or to go the other way. Now, this is a snapshot of another system, the more advanced emotional sensing SDK. We use for security purposes. This is taken in a prison setting, scanning inmate calls. Now, our original mission there was to identify people that with suicide potential and prevent violent attacks before they happen. All names and numbers have been sanitized, of course, but as you can see, there are clear repeating patterns with emotional traits and emotional state of each inmate. Some appear to be very stressful, like in this example, for example. Some appear to be very emotional and energetic. This in particular shows a high level of what we call mental effort efficiency. He is the smart guy. But even in the consistent pattern, we see changes, we see trends. That today serves as a warning sign for the intelligence officer in the prison. And that's the beauty of working in a prison setting. This is like a 24-7 monitored laboratory. Every result is then immediately verified, acted upon. Perfect. Perfect research. Around. Once we have multiple emotional readings, we can start looking at the big data and start clustering, looking at the repeating indications indicative of personality traits. In the prison settings, we could very easily identify the violent ones, the depressive ones, the smart and the con artists. But let's look further. A couple of years ago, as <laughs> yeah, you have presented, I presented in TEDx 2012, Nemesisco's emotional concept, emotional diamond concept, sorry. A graphical representation of multiple emotional traits to help us identify the emotional making of a good presenter. Is it the high energy? Is it the low stress? We actually found it's a combination of several key elements, but some 
Something that stood up across the board was that good presenters are, in fact, happy to be on stage. Also have high energy, they're also very well prepared, but the dominant fact was that they are happy. But what would make a good salesperson? It's probably not the same as would make a good service and support guy. A good accountant, a good lawyer. Can we identify a preferred and optimal profile for each type of work? It seems to have a lot of value if we have the ability to optimize workforce by tracing up dominant emotional traits of each individual. Yes, using LVA technology, computers today can read emotions. They can even learn about our personality and identify changes in our mood. Today, we provide solutions that capture people's emotions and aid professional human decisions. But what will tomorrow look like? When you look at the possibilities, it looks like it's time for computers, and I mean computer at large, including robots, cell phones, tablets, TVs, IVRs, any computer-enabled device to understand humans better. So they can take automated responses, service us better, be our friends. Computers can examine our facial expression with the cameras, listen to our conversation with the microphones, feel the intensity and speed of our typing. Yes, thank you. <laughs> develop awareness and senses. And it is a hype today, we all know. One day you will wake up to realize your cell phone is your best friend ever. It knows where we are, it knows where we are going. Using our emotional API, it will listen to our calls and will know our general mood. Maybe are we more receptive to ads this today? Maybe tune the way it presents ads to better meet our flavors. It will know how much we like or not the person we speak with. I guess that's a good thing, because it will know not to pass certain calls when I'm down or depressed, and will probably know who to call when I'm to cheer me up. Well, you hear all sorts of crazy ideas these days. If the car will sense you're tired or angry, it will not start. But name one person that will buy such a car. I guess understanding emotion, therefore, is not enough. To become a real friend, any device will need not only to have a bank of potential responses, but also to know which one to select to meet your specific character. Since emotion detection is doable today, the next challenge is really to define the set of actions and the metrics that selects actions per emotional state, per personality, per device. And I think it is time to start discussing a unified communication protocol between the different home devices. Call it the emotion detection of things. Made to serve us. Let's define a complete set of emotional API. We call it EDAPI. Besides the Orwellian ideas, I, think, I want to think with you for a moment about some real value the EDAPI can produce. Monitoring the emotional states of our elderly while keeping them company. Serving as the never-tired nurse in our hospitals. Play games and share exciting moments with our kids when we are away. Be there to aid those we, regrettably, cannot be with all the time. If these devices will be smart enough, they will let us know when our presence is really needed and will send us a note. Can computers really share our emotions? Well, they can fake it for now. To really understand our emotions, the devices must experience those too. It will also have to relate to its experience and develop its own personality. But for us to like it, the device's emotional diamond or its V personality must be compatible with ours, and then we will have the best friend possible. Comfort us when we need a comfort, give us, a show, give us advice when we need one, tease us when we need a tease. I don't think we are far from there. Some of our devices go with us and technically experience what we do. They just don't make the connections, and they don't see the patterns like we do yet. Yet. Have no doubt. Soon they will. Thank you very much.